Okay, I'm just checking if we are live. I think we are live. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Caravan. And uh, I'll start in about a minute. We are waiting for people to join in. I'll also share the link with all the Caravan viewers on, on WhatsApp. And if you want to get added in the WhatsApp group, the link is in the description of this video. So click on that link and you can join our official updates group on WhatsApp where you get all the links and um, good forwards, not like the WhatsApp university forwards on your phone. Perfect, we, we are done with that. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Caravan. My name is Ishan Sharma and welcome back to another Caravan special lecture today on 24th of August, 2022. It's 5 p.m. India, almost 5 p.m. India time. And uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to wherever you are watching it from and whenever you are watching it. Today, um, I'm very happy to host uh, a very special guest. Dr. Venu Gopal Madhipati from Ambedkar University, Delhi, and he's currently joining us from Noida. He's a modern architectural historian uh, who is currently working um, at School of Design, Ambedkar University, Delhi. His research focuses on geological thinking, modern architectural history, and eco-criticism. His publications include the book titled Water Histories of South Asia, co-edited with Dr. Subotore, another Caravan speaker at University of California, Berkeley, and Gandhian Architecture, a Time for Low-Cost Housing, which came in 2020 by Rutledge Publishing. And he has written essays in various journals and books, such as South Asia Journal of South Asian Studies, Sarai Reader 09, Simon Starling Superflex, Reprotypes, and other journals across the world. He's currently working on a book on ecological aesthetics and the social imagery, imaginary in uh, South Asia. This book draws from some of the courses he offers at Ambedkar University, including fieldwork upstream along the Yamuna River in Delhi. So uh, today's session is about Gandhi and uh, Deccan geology, the, the title of uh, the talk is I won't introduce the talk. We already shared the material on on our social media with the with the with the poster. So the title of today's session is Deccan Geology and Gandhian Varda. So without further ado, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Madhipati, for accepting our invitation to be on Carvan. It's such an honor hosting you this evening. Over to you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Ishan, um, for the warm welcome and. Um... Uh, I, I'll just actually start right away. I just, just wanted to mention um, that uh, this is more of a narrative that emerged over the course of my doing my uh, research on uh, uh, the book on Gandhi and architecture. Uh, it, it sort of became an aside project. Uh, but it's only now that I'm actually trying to bring this together with trying to get into some questions related to Gandhi, the idea of sacrifice, geological histories, and perhaps even the question of natural causation uh, in the Anthropocene. Although uh, uh, it will take me some time to get there towards the end of this paper, and it's really speculative at that last stage, but I think I'll, I'll, I'll go through it, and I think I'm just going to get started. Uh, I'll share my screen if that's okay. Um, so there's a presentation that I have. Uh, I'll just make it a little show here. All right. So, so in 2013, I was in um, one second. Sorry. Um, unfortunate. Um, so, in 2013, I just I was in uh, Vardha inquiring into the history of Gandhi and architecture in Sevagram. So this is just to give you a sense of, you know, where Vardha is, it's in like central India. And this, again, just I thought I'd just use the simplest tools available to get this across. And this is a kind of an overview of Sevagram. Um, this is a sort of a, a, a blow up, if you will. 
of the place. Um, this is Adi, uh, Adi Nivas, and that's actually Babuji right there. So this is another view of uh, Adi Nivas, which is the first residence that Gandhi kind of came to stay in. And um, so this hut, which was known as Adi Nivas, was actually um, designed slash built uh, by his follower, Madeline Slade, who's also known as Mira Ben. And it's prepared out of mud and water. So I'd only recently commenced with writing a social history of this building in uh, Shegao, as the village was known at that time. Now it's known as Sevagram. When I was introduced at the Gandhi and Magan Sangrahale, in, so I just also wanted to show you, there's another image of Adi Nivas, just to give you a sense of what these buildings look like. And this is an interior view. Um, and this is, of course, next to Bapu Kuti, which was built slightly later, maybe a few months down the road, uh, which was also originally Madeline Slade's hut, but she sort of converted this into a house for Gandhi. It's an interior view, you know, this is just to give you a sense of what the place is like. Um, so, um, so I just started writing and looking into this material when I was introduced at the uh, Gandhi and Magan Sangrahale, which is in nearby Varga town. Um, this is actually an image of the entrance to Magan Sangrahale, and this is actually what the building looks like in the exterior. And um, so I was introduced to this uh, rainwater harvesting project that Magan Sangrahale had actually undertaken, right? And this project involved improving the groundwater table by Girar, which is a small hill, actually. Uh, this is actually the distance from um, Sevagram to Girat, which is like a Darga, um, located nearly 60 kilometers away from Sevagram in the Samudrapur Taluka, which was, and this project, this groundwater harvesting project, was initiated in collaboration with the caretakers of the shrine of Baba Farid. So, this is again a planned view of the shrine of Baba, Baba Farid over there. Um, it's actually a hill, it's also known as Farid Pahar. So, so I was sort of looking into this uh, and I actually went there and I was, you know, um, hanging out, I guess if you can say. And it is at this time that I came to learn about the 19th century, this is another image of the Baba uh, Farid uh, 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 So it's at this time that I came to learn about the 19th century history of this hill, right? Uh, so apparently two geologists uh, had once prominent, prominently written about zeolite crystals or alumina silicate crystals at Mira. And these crystals, which came to be associated with miracles at the site, were, as the geologists uh, who were the Reverend Messrs. Stephen Hislip and Robert Hunter mentioned, nodules that form in trap rock. Okay, so these were like these, you know, stones which are associated with miracles. But these guys are giving us some kind of a, a scientific history of these rocks. And upon being cracked open, the nodules reveal an acicular structure or a structure that radiates from a center. So Hislop and Hunter, Hunter sort of draw attention to the to natural causation, right? That is the crystals, are they formed on account of noble natural laws and not on account of what you call spontaneous generation or you know, on account of any supernatural force, right? So it's not a miracle. It's actually natural causes which actually bring these things into existence, right? And see, so these crystals actually form in what you call trap rock, right? Which is uh, the nodules, right? The nodular trap, as we call it, which is the upper yellow layer. And interestingly enough, the trap rock which contained these nodules at Girar and also at Sita Baldi, which is, I'm going to talk about that uh, in a bit, they sat upon a layer of freshwater deposits. Now we'll try and understand what this means, right? So these freshwater deposits at Girar, as it turns out, had a story to tell. Now, Hislop and Hunter had first sighted these deposits. So this is again an image of uh, the Reverend Stephen Hislop. Um, it's, uh, you don't have an image of Robert Hunter. Um, they had first sighted these deposits on the brow of the hill of Sita Baldi, right? Now, Sita Baldi, uh, you know, uh, Baldi as it's called today, Nagpur, uh, that lay towards the north in the Nagpur region, right? So in 1845, Hislop, who was affiliated with the Free Church of Scotland, took up residence near Sita Baldi Hill to pursue missionary work. Now, here he was eventually joined by the Reverend Robert Hunter. So Sita Baldi at the time was a civil station, roughly a mile and a half to the west of Nagpur. And it comprised two different summits, Chota Tekri and Bada Tekri, and had been the site of fierce fighting in 1817 between the soldiers of the Maratha household of the, uh, of the Bhonsleys, who had ruled over Nagpur, and the British troops posted in the region to protect the, presidents, uh, the, the residents, right? So this is a sort of an image you're actually seeing uh, Chota Tekri and Bada Tekri over here. You're seeing like both summits. And so Hislop and Hunter actually were staying right next to this. 
So, and this is actually uh, an image of their mission bungalow, right? Which is, you know, this is what they were living in. That's, I mean, this is, this is probably the only image. I mean, there are other images of, you know, uh, parts of Nagpur, but, you know, this is the only image that I could find of their residence. Now it is towards this hill, uh, haunted as it may have been at the time with the conflicts in its recent history, that Hislop and Hunter turned in their 1855 essay on the geology and fossils of uh, Nagpur, of the neighborhood of Nagpur, right? So this is actually the essay that they actually published. Now, they espoused, as their diagram of Sita Baldi from the essay suggests, a, a detached scientific view of the place, right? Uh, which is that um, the diagram was a sectional elevation. So if you actually, like you cut this like a cake and you actually look at it from the side, from that where that arrow is, if you're standing right there and you're looking towards the hill, if it's been cut, this is what you'd see, right? So it, this, this hill, this section clearly reveals a layer of freshwater deposits sandwiched between an overlying layer of nodular trap and an underlying layer of vesicular trap. Now, we'll not talk too much about vesicular trap, uh, closer to the summit of the hill, right? So the summit, these, these two summits that you're seeing over here, and you actually see this freshwater deposit, this white line over here, that is the freshwater deposit. And like there's an overlying nodular trap. Remember those nodules which we saw in Gira, they're coming from that kind of nodular trap. And there's a, a, another trap formation below, right? So, um, so this clearly reveals a layer of freshwater deposits sandwiched between an overlying layer of nodular trap and an underlying layer of vesicular trap closer to the summit of the hill. Now, these freshwater deposits at Sita Baldi and the ones at Gira Hill had, one learns from on the geology and fossils of the neighborhood of Nagpur, their essay, they had risen in altitude over a vast period of time, right? So apparently more than 33 million years ago, a massive freshwater body possibly stretched in central India over such far removed locations. And they, this is again their image of Sita Baldi Hill. I've put in the color over here, but these freshwater deposits seem to recur at different altitudes. And we'll talk about why they recur, but this is also the same formation. You're seeing like, you know, this freshwater formation above which you have nodular trap, below which you have vesicular trap, right? So if you actually look at a, a map closer to the time, uh, you know, um, what you see is that uh, apparently more than 33 million years ago, uh, if indeed we could actually use this map to actually talk about that time, uh, which we can't, but we're just using it for our own sake just to get a grip on this, uh, a massive freshwater body possibly stretched in central India over such far removed locations as the present day Rajmahal, Mumbai and Rajmahindri, right? Rajmahindri, right? So while that freshwater body did not survive, so you actually, I mean, I'm just, this is just a notional rhomboid that I've made, obviously it's, you know, this is not how it was, but it's just to give you a sense of what is this extraordinarily sublimely large mass of water that you're looking at, or perhaps a series of uh, connected lakes or, you know, uh, adjacent lakes. So this is actually a massive freshwater body, inland freshwater body, right? And so, so this lake clearly did not survive, but it's deposits survived, right? And these deposits, which often contained fossils and fossilized specimens of Pfizer, which is a kind of a snail, and the uh, the elytra of insect insects, and what you know, these are all things that they're actually mentioning in their essay. And NC form endogenous leaves, they're all they, you know, they are difficult to locate because the lake is completely gone and you just have these remains, but even those remains are difficult to locate, right? However, these remains were visible in a few locations, right? Uh, the trap rock ensconcing the deposit. So this is what we're talking about. This is the sort of the deposit of that lake, which is like this middle band over here. So the trap rock ensconcing the deposits in, had in some instances prominently risen to form tablelands, escarpments and hills, such as Sita Baldi and Gira, right? So what you essentially have is if you imagine all of this at the ground level, you have a little bit of volcanic activity. This pushes things up a bit. And this is what happened at Gira, right? You actually ended up the same freshwater deposit being seen at three different levels of the, on, the, on the face of the mountain, which is what was very puzzling for these uh, geologists, actually, when they actually saw it. Like, how can the same thing happen thrice, right? It, it's almost like this miraculous uh, appearance, but it's actually really on account of, like, you know, different moments in history when you have this kind of pressure from below, which pushes, you know, uh, this trap rock upwards. That's what they're writing, right? Um, so, so this is what we're looking at. So we're basically saying that these freshwater deposits were visible in a few locations. The, uh, the trap rock had actually uh, risen prominently to form tablelands. And so what we see therefore is that Hislop and Hunter's essay, which is on the geology and fossils of the neighborhood of Nagpur, 
was principally an account of the immensity of the duration of the upward movement of these deposits, right? So, so which is the kind of thing that you're looking at? They're really, really writing about the time, right? That these deposits took a lot of time to actually reach their present position, right? This is their section of uh, Yira Hill. I just use these different colors, uh, but you know that's to indicate also that like this has happened over millions of years, right? Now, which then asks, begs us to ask this question, what is it that had prompted his and Hunter to write about the upward movement of fresh, uh, freshwater deposits? So I was also going along, right? I mean, I'd, I'd gone to write and work on Gandhi and I was ending up doing something entirely different. Who had prevailed upon them to take interest in the geology of Sita Bharti and Gira, right? So, I mean, surely the methodological naturalist credo as it emerged in Europe in the mid 19th century had something to do with their interest in the fortunes of hills, escarpments, and freshwater deposits. So, as I'm mentioning, method methodological naturalism is really trying to emphasize and give primacy to natural causes, right? There's no supernatural causes that cause anything like this, right? Insofar as we understand, uh, you know, like natural laws, we can imagine what actually may have happened, right? So, so actually, in this regard, uh, you know, one of the most important figures that you actually find in the field of geology in the 19th century is this person called Charles Lyell. And this is the book which actually tries to explain the, you know, former changes in the Earth's surface, on the Earth's surface, using, you know, present day uh, natural, uh, a comprehension of present day natural causes, right? So, so Charles Lyell's, uh, you know, um, 1850, 1837 principles of geology sort of inspired geologists all over the world to begin to draw on theories of natural causation to make conjectures about events in a remote past, right? So while a remote geological age could not be experienced, obviously, by living human beings, um, it could surely be contemplated by them, right? So which means that, um, uh, you know, uh, any physical landscape in front of oneself, even to, you know, like that's how they were imagining it in the 19th century, it could be rendered intelligible in the limiting terms and criteria of natural causation, right? So insofar as one believed in what you call the uh, what um, you know the eternal constancy of what Lyle called the laws of nature now in operation this is very important. So he's actually identifying what he thinks as laws of nature, right? And so insofar as you accept that that this is actually how you know the nature is in the present, these are the laws of nature. And insofar as you accept the constancy of the laws of nature over time, then one could at least in one's mind's eye travel back in time to a beyond human remote period and observe the formation of escarpments, hills, and valleys, right? So, so in short, so this is what methodological naturalism is, right? And so, so in short, methodological naturalism was the key towards unlocking the Earth's remote past. You can't experience it, but you can envisage it, drawing on you know, this idea of methodological naturalism in the 19th century. So surely then Hislop and Hunter were attempting through their essay on the you know, uh, geology uh, and fossils of the neighborhood of Nagpur, uh, you know, they were attempting to vouch for the rigors of methodological naturalism, right? So given how they published their essay in an international setting in the quarterly journal of the Geological Society of London, which is you know, an internationally uh, you know, uh, uh, published uh, 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 journal, and they're publishing it alongside articles, interestingly enough, uh, one by Charles Lyle himself, and, uh, and also articles on coal measures in Nova Scotia and on glacial deposits in the Isle of Man. So, you know, insofar as they're publishing it over here in this kind of global setting, one might imagine Hislop and Hunter as really foot soldiers in a, a wider, more expansive global campaign, right? I mean, I mean, they weren't just writing global, they, they weren't just writing geological histories of the Deccan or, you know, of Varda and of Nagpur. You know, that's too specific, right? Instead, maybe it's helpful to think about them as people who are more substantially engaging, engaged in espousing the cause of methodological naturalism as an approach that would animate the dynamics of geological exploration anywhere, right? It's almost like you're saying, like, look, we are actually the biggest supporters of methodological naturalism. And how are we going to show that? We're going to show how it can be applied anywhere. Even in the decan, it can be applied to help. You know, so it's, you can you can think of it like that, right? But then again, the decan was not just any setting, right? Any setting whatsoever. It's not just like some random setting. Like uh, it is actually their home, right? I mean, you have this image. I mean, this is their bungalow. This is where they're staying, and they stayed for considerable periods of time. So, so. 
Um, they lived by Sita Bandi Hill, and, and of course, much can be learned about their life over here from uh, a biography on Stephen Hislop, which is uh, which was published in 1888 by George Smith. Um, and there's there's quite an intensive engagement with life over here, right? I mean, you'll get a substantial account of it. So this is not just any landscape whatsoever. You're actually writing about your own home. You're actually using methodological naturalism to actually crack open the you know the remote past of this place that you call home. So there's something to be said then about you know their essay on the geology and the fossils uh, of the neighborhood of Nagpur as a personal narrative, right? So at a first glance, that text might appear to provide evidence of the sheer reach of methodological naturalism at a global level in the 19th century. But that's, that's what the first inter interpretation would be. But at a more particular level, the essay was probably also a record of the withdrawal of Sita Baldi and Girard from their confinement within a, you know, a, a, a homely world of comforting familiarity and piety. So it's almost like these are also places of religion, right? I mean, you know, um, Girard, for instance, is a place of religion. But there is a way in which the everyday exists in these spaces, right? So to say that you're actually going to apply the rigors of methodological naturalism to actually look at the scientific history of a place, right? It's it's literally like withdrawing that place from its availability as a everyday place, right? So, so in that sense, I think I've like tried to work on this elsewhere and argued in an essay, uh, you know, that uh, it is possible to think of his slip and hunter's drawings as being enchanted drawings insofar as methodological naturalism emerges as a new kind of enchantment in this landscape. Right, where it actually comes in a new, it's not like it's been there all, all along, right? It's a, it's a new entrant that you can imagine, you know, that these drawings not just as, as plain, simple scientific drawings, but a one to one correspondence with what's happening there. They are kind of enchanting, science is enchanting, right? So I think there are ways in which we can begin to think of alternative uh, imaginations of the part science is playing in these landscapes. Uh, so, which is to say that before these these drawings kind of provide grist for a global mill of geological thinking, they narrated in a more particular local way the becoming of this familiar place of home and this place of religiosity into a rank stranger, into a complete new strange being which belongs into ge in geological time, which can only be known scientifically, right? Now, if we turn towards today, uh, towards Stephen Hisler, um, however, we do so uh, with a wholly different set of concerns related to you know, the particularity of the place. So as it turns out, Hisler had brought attention to coal in the Deccan in his 1855 essay, which is on the connection of the Umrit coal beds with the plant beds of Nagpur, right? Now, as his biographer, George Smith mentions, it is to Hisler, Hisler that the British state owes the first scientific discovery of what we may call the coal fields of the Godavari and its affluents, covering at least 12,000 miles and now being opened up by railways south to Hyderabad and north towards uh, Jabalpur. Now, coal, as we know well, um, was a key component of British imperialism and industrialization and eventually was a key contributor to and continues to be um, anthropogenic greenhouse emissions, right? So while in the 19th century, Hislop may have drawn upon natural causation, to explain geological formations in the Deccan, natural causation again, natural laws, right? The Charles Lyellian approach. Um, uh, today, however, um, um, we sort of, um, uh, he stands implicated, however distantly, uh, in a contemporary narrative that emphasizes human causation as a driver of geological change in an Anthropocene present, right? So unexpectedly, and, um, and certainly against Hislop's own uh, intentions, uh, his geology may be a part of our own particular conjuncture, right? Our own Anthropocene present of human beings acquiring geological agency. Again, I mean, I'm just saying this is not just him. I mean, there's a wide uh, tapestry of, of, of uh, you know, of people who sort of uh, uh, involved in this, just to say that like, this is one part of a global narrative today. Now, all of this being said, I think, um, which kind of gives us some time to pause on this. Now, actually, we kind of must not forget that this is how we came here. We came here from the Magan Sangrahale, and uh, how does one even come back to the Magan Sangrahale after having been through this, this journey, right? Um, so there's something incongruous about 
turning from this uh, long excursus into geology and methodological naturalism and questions related to causation in the wider Vardha region towards um, Gandhi's stay in Vardha commencing in 1936. Now, this is an interesting conjuncture again, because I think there's something instructive uh, in, in, in sort of uh, drawing a pattern, not the least because they both, I mean, they, they, they've lived in the same region at different points in time. But what they understand of certain things are fundamentally different. So now Hislop's methodological naturalism in the 19th century and Gandhi's stay in Vardha in the mid 1930s represent entirely different, even contrasting attitudes towards the idea of causation. Now, unlike Hislop, who may have drawn on Charles Lyell to emphasize the givenness of the laws of nature now in operation, Gandhi appears less concerned about the givenness of nature and perhaps more concerned with the manner in which entities um, self-sacrificially adhered to nature's givenness. So it's a kind of a confusing um, contradiction over here. And I think maybe uh, let's try and understand what this could possibly mean. Um, so to gain a sense of Gandhi's emphasis on sacrifice, one could perhaps turn towards his 1932 letter to his nephew Narandas, roughly four years before he took up residence in Shegao and Vardha, while he was imprisoned in the Yaravda uh, jail. And uh, one second. So in that letter, Gandhi wrote about uh, a deterministic universe in which the existence of every entity was predicated on the prior existence of its relationship with other entities. So for instance, the human body and indeed the universe itself would not exist if Akash or nothingness did not exist in its place. Similarly, if the sun rested even for a day, we would perish. These are his words, right? Moreover, entities such as the moon and the countless stars also maintain the existence of this world, right? So, so this is an interesting kind of a, you know, a, a, a relational understanding of the universe uh, insofar as we want to draw on this to peep into his mind if indeed we can. So all of these celestial entities, however, did not exist passively in the universe, it would appear. Rather, their existence in their places appears to have been an act of sacrifice. Now, so while it is, while it is possible that Gandhi imagined a god or a divine being, or even plain nature, right, uh, as the prime cause, right? Methodological naturalism does that. It says only natural causation, right? So it is possible Gandhi imagined nature or even God as a prime cause that gave entities such as the sun, the moon, Akash, and countless stars, their places in the universe, right? Um, but in his letter to Narandas, he writes principally about how those entities actually stay in those places which may have been given to them, uh, actively stay in those places. Well, that's, that's the kind of important thing to understand. So for instance, the sun assumed its, ex its existence as a being that stayed in its place without taking rest because it engaged in what Gandhi calls tapascharya or a pious austere penance. Similarly, the stars were not silent because they're already quiet beings. So he calls stars quiet being, uh, silent but rather stars actively withdraw into silence out of piety, right? So what you see is this very strange and interesting kind of a, a text, you know, where the universe is clearly abounding with celestial entities who are inclined to leave their places, right? And because they ultimately sacrifice this inclination to leave their places and even their inclination to speak, uh, it is because of this that the universe actually endures, right? So this is how the universe continues because everybody is letting go of this desire, right? Of to leave their place, right? They're all staying in their place, right? So it's in this case, I mean, if, if you want to sort of symptomatically draw on this text, one way of interpreting it and saying is it's not so much the laws of nature now in operation. Remember Charles Lyell, it's not, it's not those laws of nature that are now in operation that hold the universe together as it is the force of sacrifice that holds the universe together, right? So I, I'm just saying that like, it's an interesting contrast to, you know, um, maybe 80 years before with Stephen Nislop and, you know, Robert Hunter 
and the kind of world that they are actually trying to crack open quite literally and the world that we are you know perhaps trying to um, enter into which is in the 1930s right now so it's about a short step step then from gandhi's 1932 letter to narandas to his stay in shegao which commences in the mid 1930s sometime after he's resigned from the nationalist congress party uh, in the months leading up to his shift into Shigao, he so once again writes about sacrifice, self-sacrifice, uh, although this time in rigidly anthropocentric terms, right? So while previously he's mentioned, so self-sacrifice, like the words that you'd use is foregoing, right? I mean, that's, or letting go, right? So, so while previously he's mentioned, you know, letting go or foregoing as a celestial beyond human force, right? That holds the universe together. Everybody stays in their place and that's how the universe continues. And they do it out of a sense of duty, right? Uh, even though they, they want to leave. So, but now when he's actually talking about, he's actually talking about human beings who self-sacrificially withdraw from their own more expansive personal inclinations in the favor of staying within the boundaries of their own supposedly proper place. So what you do see is some kind of a humanization of this idea of self-sacrifice, right? You're not talking about a, a beyond human conception of sacrifice. You, you're actually talking about Gandhi himself, right? Um, so, but then there's, still, there's one question that still remains. And that's the question of the givenness of boundaries and the givenness of laws and the givenness of proper places. I mean, you're saying that things have to stay in their proper places, right? But then who decides what is a proper place, right? And that earlier was answered with the question of God or nature, right? But what does Gandhi have to say about this, right? So, uh, so from what authority, for instance, did Gandhi derive his idea of the givenness of the boundary of a village when he expressed his wish to stay within his place within the boundaries of Shegao in 1936, right? He actually does this. He doesn't want to leave Shegao. And so it's this whole sort of, you know, challenge of staying in that place when he's really ill, right? So he's, he writes this very long note about how he cannot leave this place. This is the place he has to be in at this point in time and for three seasons. And he says, I have promised myself this, that I will stay for three seasons. And this is like my proper place, right? So again, this notion of like, you know, it's no longer the celestial bodies that are like sacrificing. It's he himself and he's willing to die for this. I mean, he does write about this. So, and then, you know, you start seeing this language of limits and boundaries come up everywhere. I mean, if you start looking at that portion of the 1936 archive, right? So there's, so for instance, how does he arrive at the limit of 100 rupees for the construction of his hut, right? Um, you know, this is, you know, there is a limit to this expenditure. He actually writes that I do not want more than 100 rupees to be spent on this. And then the challenge becomes staying uh, in that boundary. They actually have a few letters where he's, He's, he's telling Madeline Slade, you know, Mirabend to just hold it and don't do more. Let's stick to this, you know. So it's interesting to see this entire language of limits, constraints, and um, giving laws unto oneself and then self sacrificially adhering to them. That becomes a very big motif in the language that you see in she uh, Seva Kranti, right? So, where are these laws coming from? Where are these norms, these limits, these boundaries that he's actually putting on himself coming from? And that's an interesting and independent question, right? So, one way of answering those questions is to deem Gandhian limits as social ones, right? I mean, that's that's a very commonsensical understanding, also, but I think it resonates in the archive. Commonsensical insofar as we've heard about this, right? I mean, um, you know, that is to say that uh, you know. Gandhi's understanding of limits comes from, um, you know, it can be attributable to the fullest and widest range of associational activity, which is that it's a social sense, right? So it's not the individual, but the social, right? So, so the Gandhi archive, for instance, suggests that in, mid, in the mid 1930s, his comprehension of limits uh, may have been imminent to his experience of the villager's life. Now this villager is a very abstract category in Gandhi's thought. It's an undifferentiated category. Right, it it does all sorts of you know uh, uh, work, semiotic work, but at the same time, uh, in this case, there's clearly some experiences uh, while he's actually preparing to come to Shegao uh, in the nearby village of Sindhi, and he's hearing back from Madeline Slate, which might have something to do with his idea of these limits that he's instituted, right? So, and he does seem to be drawing on this idea of the unremitting labor of the life of the villager, right? In the, in the lives of villagers. So, so the archive, for instance, suggests that as a village worker, 
Gandhi could not leave the limits of Segao uh, simply because uh, that village, village's denizens were unable to leave Shegao on account of their unremitting labor, right? So, which means that you can't leave the boundaries of the village because living with people is showing you that they can't leave. So, therefore, as a kind of a social injunction on oneself as well, one actually brings that in as a norm, right? So, I think what you find is this kind of a, a very strong understanding in Gandhi at this time on on actually um, literally letting these uh, you know uh, truths to and these laws or whatever you want to call them uh, surface from within the experience of living itself, right? So it's not like coming from some abstract place. Certainly not coming from God, right? I mean, it seems the archive seems to be suggesting that there is uh, there is observation and then there is the sense of vulnerability towards the life of the other, right? So similarly, he stayed in a, we could say he stayed in a mud hut because the villagers uh, were bereft of the resources to adequately reproduce themselves right, and their own labor. So it's like the social reproduction of labor is, is interestingly enough, uh, one way of understanding, you know, the kinds of study, uh, the, the ways in which Gandhi is beginning to understand the lives of people over here. And so Gandhi's house, that is the thing, because he wants to do the work of village uplift, as he calls it, right? So the village improvement workers house in that sense was not a form of self-expression. It's not really Gandhi's own idea of what a house should be. Uh, rather, this house, insofar as we understand it to be fragile and difficult to live in, rendered intelligible the villagers' inability to effectively make and remake themselves on a daily basis, right? So in the way maintenance of this house and the way upkeep of this house, the amount of effort that is expended is perhaps, you know, what uh, decides you know, the limits that Gandhi imposes upon himself when he comes to thinking about house for itself. So, so one way of imagining this is the limits of architecture come not so much from within oneself, but from the other, right? So Gandhi's interest in limits instituted as they may have been socially, however, fades in prominence in comparison to his emphasis on a, a self-sacrificial adherence uh, to those limits in Singapore. Now, this is an interesting point, which is that, um, he remember in the case of like uh, um, you know uh, the text letter which he wrote to his nephew. Um, unlike Charles Lyell, unlike Stephen Hislop and Hunter, who have a clear sense of the cause, right? And unlike us today, who actually try and talk about human causation when we're actually talking about climate change. I mean, among the few texts that you know you might want to actually try and unpack. Gandhi and environmentalism directly from Gandhi. Of course, Gandhiism is a whole different phenomenon and has much, uh, very entirely uh, more expansive conception of these questions. But, but you know, going back to Gandhi himself, uh, what you do find is that the question of causation is not the most dominating one, right? So he may have given himself these limits, right? Uh, but it's ultimately the experience of adhering to them self-sacrificially that has the more prominent place in the archive, right? And so his entire, that portion of the archive is a litany of suffering, right? I mean, he's almost dying, he contracts malaria, you know, um, Mira Ben is unwell, right? I mean, he's going and nursing her, everybody is suffering at this time, right? And so it's 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 really, a, a, it's, it's, it's more of a, a, a note on, 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 sacrifice than the idea of instituting these limits, however these limits may have come. So, and I think there's something to be said about this idea of sacrifice in that sense, right? Um, it is perhaps to be expected, um, as is perhaps only too well understood in Gandhi's sense of Varnashama Dharma, it is not so much the, the arms-bearing uh, warrior of Kshatriya, I mean, it's, it's, it's often the um, arms-bearing warrior of Kshatriya who willingly suffers through acts of uh, self-sacrificial self-limitation, right? So it is that notion of sacrifice which is coming from the Kshatriya Dharma, right? Uh, which does, interestingly enough, have a small place in the archive at this time. He does mention that, which is that which keeps us from running away from the tiger of difficulty, right? So you have to stay in your place, right? So to commit oneself to staying within the place of fragility and transience, or more specifically to commit oneself to staying within the space of strain and discontinuity was to be a Kshatriya. And so in that sense, adherence to limits, the self-sacrificial adherence to limits, or even the limits which are perhaps divinely given or self-given or socially given, that adherence to it is a different thing from the givenness of limits. 
right? And our adherence is coming perhaps from one national government. So I imagine, uh, so it's, 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 it's these kinds of questions, which I think, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just gonna end it right here because I feel uh, it's already a lot of uh, need for thought. But I think when we actually begin to imagine what are the implications of this in our trying to understand, um, let's say, um, climate change discourse. Again, it's, it's not, there is a connectedness, right? I mean, as I'm saying, insofar as we are veering onto the language of causation, um, of which I think we have completely different perspectives. Like with Hisler, at once there is natural causation, and on the other side, the flip side of that is that there is also a contribution to human agency and human causation, right? Uh, Gandhi, on the other hand, um, causation is there. It has various sources. It comes about through various agencies, but it is the um, adherence to that law. Again, law is a problematic word when it comes to Gandhi because he's a lawyer who's against law. That's a different story, but it's, it's more than the givenness of the law or the cause. It is the adherence to it, which is through self-sacrifice, which has the greater salience. So I think, um, which presents challenges. I mean, if you're actually trying to imagine what would be a Gandhian response, right, to, to, to climate uh, urgency, right? I mean, I'm, I'm, I've been trying to think of this. I mean, drawing purely from this kind of a, of a train of thought, uh, I imagine, uh, like if you were to imagine, like, say, limits in terms of, like, tipping points, right, if you, the rise of temperatures um, to, you know, 1.5 degree rise in temperatures, the two degrees rises in temperatures, it's, 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 it's a limit, right? I mean, if you would imagine a, a, a Gandhian approach to that question of the limit, uh, that we have to stay in our proper place. We should not emit so much, uh, you know, uh, so many emissions so as to not exceed that boundary, right? So I suppose the question there would not be so much uh, for Gandhian perspectives, at least going principally from the primary uh, text, would not be so much in terms of the nature of the causation, right? Whether it is human or socially given or natural, it is in the uh, response to it, which is in terms of having to stay within that limits. That I imagine is where uh, the 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 more uh, affective uh, aspects of of, uh, of a Gandhian uh, response might lie. Uh, which is, of course, does that entail self-sacrificially staying within the limits of 1.5 degrees, uh, a 1.5 degree rise in temperatures, or let's say a two degree rise? How does that, what does that mean? And then, of course, that idea of self-sacrifice also, perhaps also has to uh, be socialized insofar as it is not uh, a particular, right? That it has to be plural, that it, it can't be, uh, you know, one national dharma alone, right? So I'm just saying that, you know, with all the challenges that one national dharma presents, right, in terms of uh, the hierarchical uh, thinking that it actually entails. So I think this is the kind of uh, peculiar conjuncture that actually we, we, we reach uh, with trying to sort of imagine uh, this kind of a conversation between um, geological thought and, uh, and Gandhian thought. And um, I don't know if I, made sense, but I think I'll, I'll probably uh, end at this stage just to then maybe some take some questions. Ishan, uh, can I stop sharing? Yes, sure. Thank you so much, uh, sir, for that wonderful uh, lecture and uh, <laughs> quite, uh, quite a lot to process actually because we are comparing two different ideas and uh, one is a Western sense of uh, geological history or, or something like that, but and on the other hand, is it's very natural the Gandhian approach, and then the, that you ended with the climate change and how Gandhi would have uh, processed this. And I think it's 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 a great it's it, great food for thought actually if we look to what Gandhi wrote about his experiences in Vada and even people like um, this Parmahans who has written autobiography of a yogi. He mentions his visit to Vardha. And then he mentions that two yogi walking barefoot in Vardha and his experience of living at Vardha. So I think it's, it's an interesting uh, experiment of its own kind. Uh, 
right now I do not see any questions on our live stream but people who are listening to us right now if you have any questions as we always say please drop them uh, on our email id our email id is carvanheritage@gmail.com and we'll always forward those emails to our speakers thank you so much uh, sir for for being here on carvan it was an honor and uh, the link to uh, dr madhipati's book will be shared on our youtube this youtube video's description after this live so go check that out because i think we have to implement gandhian ideas to our uh, architecture now uh, seeing the rise in temperature as uh, sir also mentioned 1.5 degrees is quite lot uh, if we see in perspective so the seva gram ashram i think is a big example of how you sustain in a place like vardha uh and as they were falling ill but still i think that self sacrifice as you say say um kept them going in some senses maybe but uh, thank you so much sir and thank you so much everybody for being here our next session is on 26th of august two days from now and we are hosting one of pakistan's most senior historian professor mubarak ali uh on the practice of history writing in pakistan because we already hosted professor anirudh desh pande on the practice of history in india and i think it was important to have an a perspective about our our neighbors too who we, we share a common heritage uh with pakistan so i think it's important to host uh academicians like professor mubarak ali to share his perspective thank you so much uh, professor madhipati